Um, the next thing I like to bring up, and I'll even give uh, sort of, uh, I guess, a shout out, as they would say in lay terms, for Dr. Rivera, who's published on this, is restless leg syndrome and multiple sclerosis. So until I actually was preparing for this talk, I really hadn't appreciated how overrepresented or, or how comorbid is restless leg and MS. And I may have a patient or two that I've missed in my practice who has this. So in the handout, which I would urge you to take on the back table, okay, there's actually four very simple uh, questions for screening for restless legs. And if you have those four questions, then it turns out that you've got about a 60 or 70% chance that you have it. So just because we pass the screening, the purpose of screening is to find people who may have a disease to be investigated further. It doesn't mean you have to have the disease, okay? But the nice thing about this disease is that it's readily treatable very well by two FDA approved drugs on the market. So if you see a neurologist for your restless leg, you will typically get Requip or Miravex. Those are the FDA approved drugs. Uh, we've been using them in neurology for as long as I've been in practice, which is, you know, 15 years. I decided after this year I'm going to start to count my <coughs> words and uh, go between 15 and 10 and stay there. But uh, we'll go, um, uh, but the internists tend to use a drug called Clonopin, okay, which basically is a drug that helps you society was to bring out depression in patients with multiple sclerosis, okay. So, uh, again, this is because if you have depression, and there's lots of reasons to have depression if you have MS. You could have depression because of adapting to the concept you have MS. You could have depression because of the disability of how MS affects your life. But it is also apparently coming out that you have, M you have depression because the way that MS has affected your brain internally helps to make you be more vulnerable to having depression, okay? So for all of those reasons, it's important to recognize people who are depressed. And I actually put in the handout the nine official screening questions that is part of the official definition of depression. So there's actually a book put out by the Psychiatry Association that kind of everybody agrees by vote for what that's worth, that if you kind of have four of these nine things, you should be considered depressed. Now, as you see, some of them are things like being fatigued or loss of energy, which of course could be from your MS, uh, and uh, difficulty with concentration. Again, that could be from the MS. So it's very hard in some patients to tell, do they have actually have depression or are all their symptoms that overlap with depression part of their MS and don't have depression? And sometimes, quite frankly, in practice, you just try to treat them, okay? Of course, there's multiple ways to treat depression, and if you see a doctor, we tend to treat with the pills, okay? You can see psychologists, and they tend to treat by talking to you, and then, quite frankly, the wellness stuff we're gonna do in the second half is very important to treat depression also, okay? So all those things, I think, work, to work better together than work, you know, on uh, their own, but we do have excellent drugs for or on depression, and depression can be kind of episodic, meaning you get it for a period of time, you treat it, you clear it, you don't have to necessarily then stay on the drugs, you'll do fine for a period of time. If you stop the drug and your depression comes back, you go back on and you're better and you stop the drug a second time and depression comes right back, at some point, the doctors, you should figure out, we'll just stay on it, okay? But for many patients, they don't have to stay on it. That's a little different than kind of the next thing that I have in my hand, which is anxiety. So there are some people who have excessively worried ever since they were kids, okay? So if you were the kind of kid that couldn't sleep at night, the night before a big test, actually, believe it or not, many of your friends slept just fine, okay? Um, if you're somebody who thinks of everything that could go wrong, okay, can't turn the brain off, uh, those are all signs of anxiety. And anxiety kind of represents a way that your brain is wired. I think of it very, anal very analogous to the way I think of my brain. There is nothing individually wrong with any individual neuron in my brain as best as we know. Okay, I haven't been, and I haven't been di dissected yet, so I don't know for sure. Okay, and anxiety, that seems to be the same thing. But you put the network together, and something's out of tune, okay? Now, we have medications 
okay, to help kind of bring you back into tuning, okay? When you stop the medications, you drift right back into out of tune. So anxiety, if you treat with medications like from me, okay, it is sort of a lifelong sort of illness. Some people can actually, by working with a psychologist or a therapist, could actually kind of get some of the could at least potentially get at some of their underlying causes of, of the anxiety that they may be able to control. In which case, in some ways, in the long run, that might be a better approach. The problem is that usually takes a large investment in time, and sometimes, unfortunately, a significant investment in money as well, okay? But most people living lives don't have the time to put into to, to it even more than the financial issues. So, but anxiety is something that, again, if you have a lot of anxiety, it impacts your sleep. Anything that impacts your sleep impacts your fatigue. Anything that impacts your fatigue will interfere with your quality of life. Many times we try people on these drugs and they come back and say, you know, I didn't know I could feel so differently. They just have, they've always worried. They've never been able to fall asleep all at night. Suddenly they can go to sleep fine. It's just a whole new, you know, feeling for them. Uh, another thing I kind of wanted to mention before I kind of like just let you guys ask questions is about spasticity. So again, this is sort of not a disease that sort of goes along with pain, but this is certainly a very common issue in patients with MS. And I bring it up because I think the tide is turning somewhat, but certainly when I started my practice 15 years ago, neurologists as a group would either use sort of one of the options, and that's kind of why I want to bring this up. So there are two. FDA approved oral drugs for spasticity. They are baclofen and Xanaflex. Okay, both of those are generic now for a long time. Okay, as you take these pills and you increase their dosing, many patients have the dose limited by central side effects. They get sleepy. They interfere with their concentration and their thinking. Okay, if you have spasticity in just a little part of your body. Okay, like just your forearm or just just a leg, then botulinum toxin therapy can be directed specifically at the problem. So that's a good option, although quite expensive. Okay, and then the one that tends to get overlooked is the intrathecal baclofen option. So instead of taking the baclofen pills by mouth, you get doses of that delivered to your spine, and spasticity is really a problem at the level of the spinal cord. Okay. So the problem may be above in the brain, not telling the neurons in the spinal cord to relax. But you can attack the problem in the spinal cord, and so since the medicine kind of flows up the spinal cord, and, the, and then around the outside of the brain, where it leaves the brain and gets metabolized, it doesn't get those high doses to the central part of the brain. So you very commonly can treat spasticity much better than you can with pills because you can deliver the drug where it's needed and avoid the problem and avoid the parts of the body where it's not wanted, the cortex of your brain where you're trying to think. So this is something that, to me, at least in working with patients, tends to get overlooked and most people kind of perceive the concept, well, I'll consider that when it's, quote, bad enough. You really should consider it <clears throat> when the oral drugs are just not, you know, adequate for what you need. If you find that as I take my oral meds and get more relief from my spasticity, I then feel tired or I can't think and therefore I don't take as many pills as I would like to take, that's the time to consider it. Unfortunately, you can do a test dose, a one-shot deal in the doctor's office and determine if it's likely to help you or not so that you don't have to go and invest in putting in the pump and getting all rigged up for the whole thing only to find out it doesn't work. So it's a great option and one thing that I think is, is uh, underused in general among uh, patients with MS. So that's sort of like, you know, I didn't watch Obama last night, that's sort of like my prepared remarks.